Karima Benoon is a professor of international law at the University of California, Davis School of Law. She grew up in Algeria and the United States and now lives in Northern California. The topic of your fatwa does not apply here is a very personal one for her. Makfoud Benoun, her father, was an outspoken professor at the University of Algiers who faced death threats during the 1990s, but continued speaking out against fundamentalism and terrorism. In writing this book, Karima set out to meet people who are today doing what her father did back then, to try to garner for them greater international support than Algerian Democrats received during the 1990s. She graduated from a joint program in law and Middle Eastern and North African studies at the University of Michigan, earning a JD cum laude from the law school and an MA from the Rackham Graduate, graduate School, as well as a graduate certificate in women's studies. Her publications have appeared in many leading academic journals. They have been widely cited, including on Slate, in the Nation Magazine, the Dallas Morning News, and the Christian Science Monitor, as well as by the UN Special Rapporteur on Violence Against Women, and the UN Special Rapporteur on Protecting Human Rights While Countering Terrorism. She has lectured around the world and has been invited to speak about your fatwa does not apply here in Algeria, Australia, Egypt, Poland, Turkey, Senegal, and the United Kingdom, as well as around the United States. She has served as a member of the Executive Council of the American Society of International Law and on the Board of Directors of Amnesty International USA. Currently, she sits on the board of the Network of Women Living Under Muslim Laws. Karima Benoun has been a consultant on human rights issues for the International Council on Human Rights Policy, the Soros Foundation, the Coalition to Stop the Use of Child Soldiers, and for the United, and for the United Nations Educational Policy and Scientific and Cultural Organization, UNESCO. Her human rights field missions have included Afghanistan, Bangladesh, Fiji, Lebanon, Pakistan, South Korea, Southern Thailand, and Tunisia. In 2009 to 2010, she was one of a group of international experts assembled by Leiden University under the auspices of the Dutch Foreign Ministry to develop a new set of policy recommendations on counterterrorism and international law. She traveled to Algeria in February 2011 to serve as an observer at pro-democracy protests with the support of the Urgent Action Fund for Women's Human Rights, writing a series of articles about these events for The Guardian. In October 2011, she volunteered as an election observer during the Tunisian Con Constituent Assembly elections with Gender Concerns International. Um, most recently, her writing about North and West Africa has appeared in the San Francisco Chronicle and the New York Times and on the website Open Democracy. Thank you so much for being here, Karima. Thank you. Would you kind enough to read a selection from your book? Absolutely. First, let me say thanks to everybody for coming out. Thanks to the Texas Book Festival for having me here. And my apologies for starting just a couple of minutes late, but that's what happens when you try to bring your luggage into the Capitol building. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to tell a story, and I'm glad that I got a laugh there, because I want to tell a story that is not funny at all. Um, a story that is really at the heart of my book that stays with me all the time when I do this work because I'm a law professor and this is a story of a law student. And I just need to give you a little bit of background before I read this story, which is called Dying for Knowledge. This story takes place in Algeria, so in my father's home country, back in the 1990s, in what Algerians call the Dark Decade. And this was a decade of violence between jihadist groups that were the sort of so-called Islamic State of that time in North Africa and the Algerian government that was backed by the military. And we don't know the exact figures, but somewhere between 100,000 and 200,000 people were killed, primarily by the armed groups, though there were also gross abuses committed by the state. Uh, and this happened in relative obscurity. The international community did not pay much attention. This was the pre-9-11 world, and I think globally we had not woken up to the dangers yet uh, posed by jihadist movements. So it's in that context that I would like to share this particular story. ML Zanun Zawani's watch stopped at 517. That is the moment that she fell in the street on January 26, 1997 an instant after a member of the armed Islamic group cut her throat on the outskirts of Sidi Musa. In November 2012, when I am finally able to locate them in a quartier populaire east of Algiers, I spend several hours talking with ML's mother, Horia, and her surviving daughters. Sitting on the couch in front of her TV, 
Khalti Horia, or Auntie Horia, as everyone calls her, wears a long blue dress and glasses that hang around her neck. Both stalwart and shattered, she shows me ML's watch, which was returned to her by the police. Its white face features small green flower buds just under the spot where the glass is broken. The second hand still aims optimistically upward, frozen 57 seconds after 517, and approaching a 518 that will not come. 22 years old and a third year law student at the University of Algiers, Emma lived in the dorm. She wanted to visit her family on that 17th day of Ramadan, a day known as Ghazwat Badr in commemoration of an historic Muslim victory. So she boarded the bus for Sidi Musa, her hometown, and would never finish law school. Emel's mother tells me everything she had heard about what happened on the bus. Just outside the town, the vehicle was stopped at a faux barrage, a fake checkpoint. Emel occupied a seat behind the driver who was a neighbor of hers and held her school bag. Though she did not cover her head in Algiers, she had a friend's shawl wrapped around her hair when the men from the armed Islamic group climbed aboard. One came to Emel, hit her on the shoulder and said, Ahl al-Hukuma, partisan of the government, get up, someone kill her. They grabbed the law student by the arm and still she dared to say, don't touch me. According to Khalti Huria, Emel then turned and looked at everyone. Even now, the mother appeals to her daughter's fellow passengers as she weeps and tells me the story. ML did not speak, but she begged you with her eyes and asked you to save her, but no one could. When they got out of the bus, one armed man had a knife and was rubbing it on the pavement, preparing to kill her. There are two versions of what happened next. Some said ML was kicked as she was getting out of the bus and fell to the ground. Others remember that she had her throat cut while she was still standing. Her death was an atrocity. It was also meant as a warning. In the moment after ML's watch stopped, the GIA men told all the other passengers, if you go to school, if you go to the university, the day will come when we will kill all of you just like this. The terrorists had posted placards all over Sidi Musa saying that young people must stop studying and stay home. As a law professor, I so want to understand why a young woman with her whole life ahead of her would continue her legal education when she could and would be murdered as a result. Apparently, ML had said to her father, I will study law and you will always have your head held high. I am a girl and you will always be proud of me. I will do the work of a man. Mrs. Zanun herself, a housewife, had long dreamed of her children studying, and all six of them did. Emma's sister Emina explains, our mother inculcated in us the idea that studying means you are a free woman. Mom said, I am ready to lose all four of them. I will sacrifice them for knowledge. When people remember Emel Zanun, who was assassinated by the terrorists, Emina says, they say she was the girl who was killed for studying law. People say she was an example for us. While still cherishing the values that Emel died for, her death was also an agony for her family, and so was the way they found out about it. Sidi Musa was then a wasteland of terror. That was their hometown outside of Algiers. It had no running water at the time, it had no electricity after the terrorists had attacked the local power station and no telephone service. So the family was never sure when to expect ML or their other daughters home. Finally, 20 policemen showed up at the door, but faced with the mother and her younger children, the policemen found themselves completely unable to deliver the news that they had come to give. One asked Khalti Huria how many daughters she had who studied in Algiers, then told her enigmatically that she and her husband had been convoked to meet the prosecutor the next day. Their work undone, the cops drove off and left the family wandering in the, wondering in the dark. Khalti Huria had a bad feeling. Any of her college student daughters, or all three of them, could have been headed home that night. 
When the police left, a group of neighbors came to the apartment, including the bus driver's 